10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's take off. Ooh. <laughs> so welcome everybody to uh, this uh, session, the afternoon session. And this is, I agree with you, it is afternoon for me. It's actually a long afternoon. It's 8 p.m. over here in Perth. And uh, it's just past 12 noon in UK and many other countries in the world where you're listening to this. And so I hope you've been enjoying it so far. What we have on the program for this afternoon is to carry on with the Sutta, the Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta, and with a lot of embellishments from Ajahn Brahm, I have to say that, because just reading the Sutta by itself is something you can do at home any old time. And having it explained with a bit more information uh, helps to get a deeper understanding of what it is and where it stands and how it relates to meditation. And not only that, that it can overcome a lot of difficulties, misinterpretations of uh, some of these ideas and concepts. Always remember that the Buddha never uh, taught mindfulness of breathing. He taught Anapanasati. In other words, even the, the English translations, are sometimes they miss the point a little bit. And it's one of the reasons why that when you can get into the, the uh, original language and really get into it, and also to read more widely, not just one sutta, but connected discourses. I don't mean the, the um, Anguttara Nikaya or Samyutta Nikaya. I mean just other teachings about mindfulness of breathing. And then also that you practice these things yourself and you find out what really works. And there you find out a lot about what these things actually mean. Uh, mindfulness is a very simple word and very accurate word. But when we get further on in the Anapanasati Sutta to stillness, this word is Samadhi in um, Pali. And still even these days, way too many people translate Samadhi as concentration. For those who have been to any of the living retreats, where you know stay overnight or overnight for a week or something, and I say it'll be very careful going to any retreats where they call it a concentration camp. <laughs> because a concentration camp has got a very, very bad reputation. And so have retreats where they talk about concentration. Because concentration, again, is what you do through willpower. And this is just an anecdote that when I first, first went after all those years as a monk, to do some teachings in Malaysia. Malaysia, first of all, Singapore afterwards. When I went to Malaysia to give some talks, people would come to me and they say, how can I please um, remedy what they call samadhi headache? I said, what? Well, when I meditate, they say, I get a headache. There wasn't just one person, it was a common affliction. And that really, the word I like to use is bamboozled me. In other words, discombobulated me. There's two words which I like in the English language. In other words, confused me because I never understood how on earth a person could meditate and get headache. So for me, meditation is what you did if you had headaches to, to <coughs> get past them, to actually to leave them behind. And then actually, then I found that people were using way too much willpower in their meditation, they're trying too hard. And of course, if you try hard for half an hour, and sometimes even for an hour, of course, you will increase your stress levels, not lessen them. And that's totally the wrong way of meditation. And also, to let you know that some of you may have gone to other teachers or read in books, they say that to do breath meditation you must focus on the tip of your nose. That's what they say. And I couldn't understand at first why the people who were doing breath meditation were getting headaches across their, their forehead. Until so, you know, I contemplated it, soon the, the answer, the solution came up. And, oh, I don't know if you can, I don't think that uh, 
uh, you can actually see my eyeballs. If I meditate with my eyes open, or you can actually try um, focusing on the tip of your nose with your eyelids open. Focus on the tip of your nose with your eyelids open. And you find out what the mind looks at, the eyes tend to follow and want to see as well. So people who are meditating with the eyes closed on the tip of the nose, their actually eyeballs are also just focusing on the tip of the nose. And if you peel their eyelids open, they'd be cross-eyed. And if you are using your eyeballs like that, focusing on the tip of the nose for half an hour, of course you're going to get a stress headache across your forehead, simply because just the physical problem of focusing your eyes just on the tip of your nose for such a long time. And that actually solves so much headache problems in Malaysia amongst the meditators. No, they don't even talk about samadhi headache anymore. And with the mindfulness of breathing, as I mentioned yesterday, and as I hope I've reinforced with all the meditation teachers I've given, meditation teachings which I've given so far, that these all go together, learning how just to relax, relaxing the body, relaxing the mind, and the breath just comes up by itself. <coughs> And to understand where this comes from, I like to give the, the story of um, the flotation tank, otherwise known as a sensory deprivation chamber. And I've been in the city of Perth now for over 36 years. And when we first came here, this gentleman came to see myself and the other monk who was with me, Ajahn Chakra, still remains a very good friend. And he said that he had a flotation tank, the first one to come into Australia even. And he invited us to try it out to see whether it helped our meditation. And I thought it was a wonderful idea because you know what it's like when you meditate, you try and find a comfortable posture and your, your, your legs ache, your bottom aches, your head aches and something else aches. It's very hard to get comfortable physical post posture. And sometimes it's too cold or it's too hot to get that perfect physical temperature. And also there's always some noise somewhere around to disturb you. So these sensory deprivation chambers, if you've ever been in one, it's like there's water in there and the water is salty water. So you float in it. You don't touch sort of any part of the box in which you're put in. So there's no pressure on any of your limbs or your bottom or anywhere. And the water is at body temperature. So you can't even feel it. And they close the lid so it's dark. You can't see anything. It's soundproof so you can't hear anything. Obviously there's some um, air being pushed through the system. Otherwise you'd, you'd suffocate. So it's just so comfortable in there. And then, because we have this seniority in Buddhism, and sometimes I could appreciate poor Venerable Chanda when she complains that women always put the end of the line, that's really unfair, and it is unfair. And it happened to me this time because I was second monk, so the senior monk had to first go in the sensory deprivation chamber. I was scheduled, I had my appointment for the following day. But I never got to go in the sensory deprivation chamber because we saw in the newspaper, the local newspaper, the following morning, there was a big advertisement by the fellow who brought the sensory deprivation chamber into Australia, saying sensory deprivation chambers as used by top Buddhist monks in the state. He never had permission to use that. He just conned us into inviting us so he could use the fact that we had actually, or a senior monk had gone into that chamber to actually to promote his business. But it was a scam. But nevertheless, I never got to go in one, but it didn't really matter. But I asked the head monk who went in there, what was it like? It must have been so easy to meditate in there. And he told me, he said, oh, it was wonderful in the sense that you had no physical uh, problem with the body. And it was, it was dark and it was... Um, just the right temperature. But he said the biggest problem was 
But as soon as he was started to relax in there, all he was aware of, and it was very, very loud, was his breathing. Because that was going on in there when all the other objects, you know, which can usually take your attention away from the breathing, the sights and the sounds and the smells and the tastes and the physical touches, when all those other sense, um, sensory distractions are taken away, your breath becomes so clear, it's the only thing left moving. When he told me that, I realized that, yes, this is why the Buddha taught the breath meditation. Because as you relax when you're meditating, and as you start to become peaceful, and you're not hearing things, you're not seeing things, you're not smelling, tasting, and just, you know, your body is reasonably comfortable, you'll always have this breath, breathing in, breathing out. The only thing left moving, the only thing which is actually happening, and naturally you become aware of it. So whether you've ever heard of breath meditation before or not, if you really relax and let go of your body, relax it to the point it gets so comfortable that you, you're not disturbed by it at all, you'll find your breath becomes there for you. And this is actually understanding this. These days, I said, I think yesterday, <coughs> I never, after all these years of meditation these days, go looking for my breathing. I just relax. I go relaxing my body, go into this peaceometer, and I, I practice what I, what I teach. Go to the peaceometer, make my mind very, very peaceful and calm. And when it gets very peaceful and calm, I notice the past and the future disappearing. And then all the, the naming, the thinking going, when all that disappears, the only thing left to watch is the breathing at this point. So the breath comes to me. I don't go searching for it. And when it comes to me, it only comes at the right time and place when I'm very peaceful and I'm aware. And then it's easy to watch. And I don't do anything with the breath. I just watch it, just as I was saying this morning. Just now is the most important time, and the breath is right there in front of me. I don't choose to watch it, it just comes by itself, and I care for it. And those little practices of just this is the most important thing, what's right in front of you. The most important thing to do is to care, it's happening right now. That is how I do my breath meditation. And of course, there comes a time when the breath vanishes. And now, I'm going to explain why, by using the Buddha's Anapanasati Sutta. So yesterday, I did begin by just the first four stages. So I'll go back to the very beginning again, and the four stages I'll just pass over quite quickly. So it starts off with the Buddha saying that how it's developed that here a meditator goes to the forest or the root of a tree to an empty hut. In other words, seek some sort of solitude. And this morning when I was talking about the, imagining you're the Buddha sitting under a Bodhi tree, just on a nice soft cushion. You know, sometimes I imagine what that must have been like, like I did this morning. Just, it's a beautiful place to meditate. It was peaceful. It was quiet, it was cool. And it is part of our tradition, people who know how to meditate, to find some physical comfort for yourself when you're meditating. And also to have a good meal before you meditate. At least not to be hungry. Obviously not to have been overeaten and become sleepy, but to become just comfortable, having had the good meal, sitting down, in a nice situation. And then, making mindfulness a priority. And making mindfulness a priority and sitting in a comfortable position is the reason why that I encourage people when I do guided meditations. To, the most usual way of doing guided meditations 
is to become aware of your body first of all and relax it to the max, every part of your body. Getting a really good cushion or chair, getting many cushions or chairs. And to this day, I'm very surprised that there has not been more technology put into meditation cushions to make them more comfortable for modern meditators. And sometimes years ago, I fantasized about what a good meditation cushion could be. First of all, you know, you can't just sit on the same cushion every day, think it's going to work all the time. So I thought we can have a remote control to inflate parts of the cushion. The back can raise up if you need to raise your bottom or the size so your knees can be comfortable. Uh, they can heat the cushion up just like on um, uh, heated seats. If you go to toilets in Japan or to, to South Korea and uh, you can have it nice and um, cool if you want it to be cool. And you can raise it this way or that way until you get the most, you know, the remote control. And to overcome sloth and torpor, you can actually press another button and then you get a cup of tea coming out the side or coffee if you prefer it. Prefer it. Either way, I mean, that's going a little bit too far with my silly fantasies. But nevertheless, to get a position so you are comfortable, you're looking after your body, you're caring for it and then caring for the mind. And many people have a difficulty understanding what the heck the mind is. We have all these words. And sometimes we don't know what the words are. We can write them down on a piece of paper, even like a, the most important word like let go. Many people have said, yes, we know how to spell that and we know how to pronounce it, but what does it mean? How do we do it? And something so simple like the word let go. So many people, even meditators, don't know how to do that. In this particular case, we're going back to just how to, to be aware of our mind. What is this mind? And to help people understand how to be aware of the mind, I just introduce this peaceometer because it's a quality of the mind which you're being aware of how peaceful or how agitated it is. And the peace or agitation don't live in the body, they live in the mind. So once you realize how peaceful or how agitated you are, you are looking at one aspect of your own mind by which you can know peace or agitation. And then you can relax your mind and as you relax your mind the only way to relax the mind is to be mindful and to be kind so i was saying this after this morning that the the monster in the empress's palace when you're kind to the monsters the monsters they get smaller they shrink and they're not a problem anymore so this, this is how we learn how to be aware and mindful well, actually awareness is mindfulness. But we learn how to be mindfulness and increase the power of that mindfulness. So if you're practicing by relaxing your body and then relaxing your mind, so this little method is other methods as well, like the one which I did of imagining your enlightened being sitting under a Bodhi tree and how does it feel? And you find that the mindfulness starts to increase. By increasing, I mean you can see more. You can feel more deeply. You're becoming more alert, more alive, and less distracted by things. And this is one point of mindfulness training, which is so ignored. And I can't see why. We, we, in, we are increasing the power of our mindfulness. When your mindfulness gets to a a powerful enough stage, then you can watch your breath easily. It just comes to you. There's nothing else to watch. And I know sometimes, even myself, when I started doing breath meditation, you started you know, bringing up your breath and your mind will wander away again. And you bring the mind back again, it'll wander away again. It'll bring the mind back again and it'll wander off again. 
And I was doing this for about five or six years. I thought this was practice. It was actually stupidity. The only reason why my mind would not settle on the breath, because my mindfulness was not strong enough yet. And the other times now when my mindfulness is really nice, the breath just comes up, it's the only thing left moving. So I'm sitting there, eyes closed, the body's so relaxed, it's, you can hardly feel the, the external part of the body. And you're very, very peaceful, just aware, mindful. And you start to feel your breath. Breath coming in, breath going out. So the mindfulness, getting the mindfulness strong is important. And you've, after a while, you know when it's strong enough that the breath is just going to come and it's easy to watch. So that's what the Buddha meant by, <coughs> first of all, making mindfulness a priority, making sure that that's strong. And then when in-breath and out-breath are being are long, you know, you're aware that they're long. The in-breath and out-breath are short, you're aware that they're short. You don't deliberately breathe in long or short. And even actually you don't need to focus on them. They're just there. So you just know them. And then experience the whole of the breath. This is just what develops. As you focus more and more, as your mindfulness gets stronger and you're more peaceful, you see much more of what's going on there. And I gave that uh, simile yesterday of just watching the, the, the ripples on a beach. They come towards you in the nature of the tide, or the tide, the, the, uh, the ocean just fades away again, ebbs and flows. Just very softly. And at first you may just notice it coming up, going down. And then after a while you see just the whole of the process. This is not something which you force yourself to do. It's something which is a natural phenomena as your awareness grows. And then you calm, or you, you what does it say? You learn how the breath becomes calm as you breathe in and out. You just notice it as by leaving it alone, by making peace, being kind, being gentle, caring for what's going on, you find that the breath becomes really, really calm. And those become the four stages of the meditation. You're focusing on a very simple part of your body, the breathing, because that's the only thing left moving. Now what happens next, the next four stages, is where I always call this the fun part, where the pivot part of meditation, where you start to really enjoy this. Excuse me. Uh, in the sutta, you learn to experience joy as you breathe in and out. You learn to experience pleasure as you breathe in and out. You learn to experience the mental formation of piti sukha. This is joy and pleasure as you breathe in and out. And you learn to calm this mental formation of piti sukha as you breathe in and out. These next four landmarks of meditation. Now you experience joy as you breathe in and out. This is where the breath becomes delightful. As I've mentioned yesterday, you're just breathing in and breathing out and it's so peaceful, so calm. The breath is nice. And that joy and happiness come up and if we look at the sutta carefully, you see the next uh, landmark is you learn to experience this mental formation of Piti Sukha as you breathe in and out. And this is a different type of breath than you experience beforehand. In those first four landmarks, the first four stages of Anapanasati, you're experiencing the physical feeling of the breath, how it feels on your fifth sense of touch. And on this stage of meditation, you're knowing how the breath feels. You're experiencing it through a sixth sense, through the mind. And the experiences, you're feeling a much more pleasure with it. It is your mind and mindfulness is getting strong enough. It is the mind adds the pleasure onto the breath. This is where you realize just how 
the physical feelings can be just quite bland. But when the mind starts to know these things very clearly, it becomes very, very delightful and joyful. And so often in meditation retreats, you know, sometimes you see meditators just, uh, just watching a, a bush outside the meditation hall, just watching it and transfixed by the beauty of those leaves or the, the twigs. They're transfixed because that tree is not beautiful. But the mind is so strong, it can see the beauty. It adds the beauty onto these things. And this is where you understand this is a mental formation, how the mind is experiencing, in this case, the breath. So the breath is actually transformed a little. You know that sometimes I've seen uh, friends who have gone overseas to ordain. This happened recently, not overseas, but one of the, uh, the workers, the volunteers at our centre in Perth. Now she was so efficient uh, working in our office, but then she got so inspired that she decided to ordain as a, as a nun. And I remember just when I first saw her, she was only in Anagarika, that's a wearing white, the first stage of, of serving the community before she takes the novice ordinations and then the bhikkhu, bhikkhuni ordination. And just seeing her just with a bald head wearing white, this white, this uh, white robed, bald headed woman came up to me and said, how oh, Ajahn Brahm, I just came up to see you to check in. And I looked at her and honestly, I said to her, oh, no, who are you? <laughs> and then she said, I'm Dimmy. I was the, the, uh, the uh, administration officer in your office. And she looked totally different at first. First of all, you saw her as a laywoman. Now you saw her as a, a monastic. And it took me a while to make that connection between the two of them. The appearance was not the same. And that's similar to how the breath appears. When you start meditating on the breath, you feel the physical feeling of it. And when you get to these fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth landmarks of the Anapanasati, mindfulness of the breath, the breath actually is experienced differently. You're seeing more how the mind picks up the experience of breathing. It's a mental formation, a chitta sankara, and it's much more delightful. And that's an important part of this process of meditation. Just like when you are meditating on your body and you really, really relax, it becomes delightful. That delight in the relaxation of your body is also a chitta sankara is how the mind views a body which is so, so calm and relaxed. And it's an important stage in the breath meditation to experience the, the breath going in and going out with joy and happiness. It comes by itself. But I must admit that sometimes it may come and people don't notice it because for some reason or another, People have the idea that meditation or spirituality or religion has to be suffering and harsh. And if you're not feeling pain, you're not practicing. Which is a very silly idea. In the way of meditation of, in Buddhism, it's also always a very, very happy path. And I often sort of point out to people the Dhamma Chediya Sutta, which is also in the Majjhima Nikaya, as well as the, the uh, Sutta of, uh, which I'm reading out now, the Anapanasati Sutta. But in Dhamma Chediya Sutta, they have a wonderful description of the king after work, after finishing work, going into the monastery with no sort of fanfare, with no people looking after him, just you know, walked into the monastery and looking for the Buddha, and when he saw the Buddha, you know, he bowed to the Buddha and just said to the Buddha, just what a wonderful monastery that was. 
And the Buddha asked him why. And this was the most important part of this anecdote or this quotation from the Sutta, the Dhammachedya Sutta. The king said, I always love coming into this monastery because the monks here are always smiling and happy. And the Buddha said, well, that's what you can expect when the monks are practicing meditation properly and getting insights. This is a happy path. And that happiness should be seen on the faces and the demeanor of your favorite nun or your favorite monk. That's a sign that the meditation is going deep. It should also be seen on you. And even to this day, if someone comes up to me and said they've had a deep meditation, first thing I look at is the position of your mouth, honestly. And if you look miserable, I say that couldn't have been a deep meditation. But if you have a big smile on your face and you're joyful and happy, you say, well, that's a good chance. Let's hear more of what you've been experiencing. <coughs> so little by little, we develop the joy of meditation. Don't be afraid of the joy. It's what's supposed to happen. If it comes up, don't try and grab it. Don't try and chase it away. And it's amazing how many people try and chase it away. They think they'll get attached. You're supposed to get attached to the joy of meditation. Uh, I think I said that the first night. But anyway, this is what is meant to happen. You develop the joy watching the breath. And one of the other anecdotes is the very first meditation retreat, which I did, which I was participating in. I didn't know too much about meditation, but at least I was, you know, followed the instructions, was pretty adept at getting into some nice quiet meditations. But at this meditation retreat, we were allowed to go outside for a walk before breakfast for one hour every morning. And I must admit, not because of laziness, I was a fit young man in those days, but I would go to the botanical gardens close by to the retreat center. It was like a few boarding houses in, in Bateman Street in Cambridge. I went to the Botanical Gardens thinking what a wonderful place that would be to have a walk early in the morning. The gates were open, but I never got much past the gate because at the front of that, that part of the, it was like a back gate, that part of the Botanical Gardens, there was a, a, a bamboo tree or you know a couple of bushes of bamboo. And when I just looked at them, they looked so incredibly beautiful. I never see bamboo, which was so slender and bent so sensuously, is probably the best word, you know, under their own weight, just in the blue morning sky. And I was just transfixed and I just watched the different colors and just their slender little leaves of this clump of bamboo. I was so transfixed, there was a seat close by. I sat down on that and just gazed at that clump of bamboo until I realized my time for exercise was up. I went back for breakfast. I returned the next day for eight of the nine days. All I did was look at that clump of bamboo in the morning, hardly any exercise at all. And it was always beautiful. I never finished with it. And then after retreat was over, back to studies and busyness and one afternoon i just i missed my most beautiful clump of bamboo so i went on my bicycle and went to that clump of bamboo and i was just devastated i never where's my beautiful bamboo all i saw in its place was this desiccated dry dusty piece of bamboo in a place where it should never been planted anywhere bamboo I need some warmth. And Cambridge is very, very cold. And there I got a great insight. Why was that bamboo so beautiful two weeks before? And now it was just so ordinary and dull. And the reason was two weeks before, my mindfulness was very strong. And so that Chitta Sankara was seeing the beautiful beauty in an ordinary piece of bamboo was there for me. But now, having my mind much more tired, 
much more exhausted from all the work and social life of a young student. Now when I saw that clump of bamboo, it didn't look beautiful at all. That is what strong mindfulness does for you. Little by little, as you meditate, you see more beauty in things which you never thought you'd see beauty in. Just like your breath. The breath appears delightful. Piti sukha. This delight, this joy, as you're breathing in and breathing out. And the result of that means you don't need to focus on your breath. The breath draws you in. Just even this evening before I walked into this room, there's, even though it's quite late, this is the, uh, the summertime here in Perth, in Australia. And so the sun was just going down at eight o'clock. It's before eight o'clock, at quarter to eight when I came into this room. I just paused, this beautiful sunset this evening, just here in Perth. I'm just watching to see that. But sometimes, you know, the sunset's not so beautiful if I'm busy. If I'm peaceful and relaxing, meditating, everything looks incredibly beautiful because this is what mindfulness does. It creates a lot of joy and happiness in ordinary things. So there you are, just watching your breath, and your breath becomes delightful. And to understand how much delight it experiences in this fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth stage of Anapanasati, what happens is on a retreat, especially for those who are keeping the, the eight precepts, Keeping the eight precepts, you can't eat anything after noon. And so often I would see these meditators in the hall. Comes to 11 o'clock, lunchtime, and you see them still sitting there. 11.30, still sitting there, 12 o'clock, still sitting there. They miss their lunch, knowing they're not going to have anything to eat until the following day in the morning. And I ask, actually, I know what they're doing and I smile. I know the reason why they're still meditating there is they made a decision. The joy of meditation, this stage of meditation, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth stages of Anapanasati, is much more enjoyable than eating. And they have this decision or should I get up or should I carry on meditating? I know I'm going to miss my meal, but who cares? The joy is much greater than the need to eat. And that just gives like a measure of what's going on and how you start to really enjoy just watching the breath. For some people, it's crazy. I mean, you're watching the breath and it's joy coming up. Yeah, and how much joy? That's just one way of measuring how much joy it is. You'd rather carry on meditating than eat, even if you're going to be hungry all afternoon and evening. That's how it feels like. So anyway, why the Buddha says I should actually do some more of what the Buddha says instead of my own explanations of it, but I think that explanation is really important. Uh, so, when you learn to calm this mental formation of pity, so as you breathe in, it doesn't disappear, it just, uh, the breath gets even more still, more peaceful, and the joy gets greater. And on those occasions, this is how the Buddha taught, you are mindful of experience, of Vedana. That's another word, instead of calling Vedana feeling, I prefer experience. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. This is how the Buddha says, for being mindful of the pleasure associated with this stage of breath meditation, is being mindful of an experience. This is why on that occasion, a meditator abides mindful of experience, having restrained the five hindrances, energized fully aware of the purpose of mindfulness. That's why it's a, the second Satipatthana practice. So what happens next? I'm just reading now. I'll explain afterwards. When you learn to experience the chitta as you breathe in and out, when you learn to brighten the nimitta, bring joy to the chitta as you breathe in and out, when you learn to settle the nimitta as you breathe in and out, when you learn to enter jhana, liberate the chitta as you breathe in and out, those are the next four stages. 
and those are incredible stages is 9, 10, 11th and 12th. You learn to experience this jitter, this mind, as you're breathing in and out. What's happening is you've been watching the breath, first of all, the physical feeling of the breath. And then you've been watching, just quite naturally, without force, the delightful feeling of the breath. The, uh, what you call that, the chitta sankhya, the mental formation of the breath, which is delightful, and it calms down. And then the breath as you knew it before, it's gone. Because everything has calmed down, you don't need any effort. You can really relax to the max and the breath is still there for you and it just gets so refined, so delightful, it disappears. You're still breathing in and breathing out, but so softly and so calmly. And the joy, the happiness, the pity sukha gets stronger and stronger and that appears as what we call the, the nimittas. These are the lights in the mind, the joyful experiences, the beautiful lights which you experience at this part of the meditation. Now I know that I know that one monk anyway says, Ajahn Brahm, you're just you're saying something which is not in the suttas. Because you know, they don't mention nimitta in the suttas, so they claim. But anyway, if anyone wants to to uh, check me up on that. It's in Sutta number 128, which is the Upakalesa Sutta. And, but you have to look at the footnote if you're using the Pali Text Society translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. Because there in that Sutta, he calls it that thing, that thing, that thing. It's repeated many times in that Sutta. You look at the, foot, the footnote and you say, oh, that refers to Nimitta. And that particular sutta is all about the experience of these nimittas and just how to perfect that experience. And the upakalesa are all the problems which people have with nimittas, like excitement or fear. These are powerful states of mind, but it's there in the suttas. I'm not making this up from the commentaries. It's right bang there in the teachings of the Buddha. But anyway, that you're experiencing a nimitta. And most of the time, nimitta appears as beautiful lights in the mind. Sometimes they're just even like visions. You know, you see sort of, I call these complicated nimitta. Nimitta such as, such as scenery, like beautiful rolling hills or lakes or waterfalls or people. The visionary nimittas are usually the most common. Sometimes people experience beautiful sounds or even you know, delightful smells, but they are much more difficult to work with. The lights are much better. And if you see these things, they're always very, very delightful. A lot of pity, sukha, a lot of happiness with them. And to develop them, once you experience the nimitta, the breath has vanished and you see these beautiful experiences, you learn to brighten the nimitta, bring joy to it. In other words, increase the joy and the happiness. And the brighter those lights are, the clearer it is, of course, the more joy and happiness is there. Sometimes people, they, they call it like a screen nimitta. I've had a lot of people saying that, like there's a white screen, it's not really bright. And they said, it's not enough joy in your mind there. And if you see like a nimitta, like a screen, just don't worry about it. Just focus on the most clean, beautiful part of that, whatever you're watching. Zoom in. And you don't have to do this anymore because I suggest this. It's just what happens now. It's brainwashing. I agree with that, but it's beautiful stuff. Ajahn Chah did that to me and thank, thank you, thank you, thank you for doing that. You go to the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part and the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part of the most beautiful part. And that um, nimitta gets brighter and brighter. When you see these lights, you find out that they are they're like colors which you don't see in the, the world of the using the eyes. If they're yellows, they're incredibly yellow. The blues are very deep blue. I usually say more blue than blue. 
And the colors you can't see with the eyes, but you can see them with the mind, much purer, much more beautiful. So you brighten up and strengthen this experience. How do you do that? Just by not interfering, just by being peaceful. This is experience which is happening right now. Just care for it. Because the biggest problem is, I don't know why people do this, they do all the right things up until they get these nimitas and then they think, wow, nimitta, now I can just try and own it and capture it and keep it there. That's not how you, you deal with these things. I'll say more about this later on in maybe question time or tomorrow. But this is what one experiences, the beautiful lights in the mind. Just experience them and enjoy them, but don't try and control them. And then what's the next one? You learn to settle the nimitta, to keep it still as you breathe in and out. It's beautiful light in the mind. The more you do, the more you make it move. And if you're just absolutely still when you're watching these things, just calm in this moment, being patient, the nimitta, this light in the mind becomes incredibly still. It's just there. And usually I must say that for most people, the nimitta when it gets still and when it gets beautiful, it's like a like a seeing a moon in your mind. A beautiful round shape which doesn't move. It's there. And the light gets brighter and more beautiful and more delightful. It's brighter and brighter and brighter. Then what happens? Then uh, you enter the jhana, you liberate the jitter, the mind. To liberate it, it's the mochiang, it's the Pali word. It means that you liberate it from, I'd say two things. You liberate it totally from your body for the time being, so that you can't feel the body anymore. The last part of the body you are feeling, the breath is gone. You're not seeing. You're not hearing, smelling, or tasting. The five senses have been subdued. And all you've got left is that sixth sense, the mind. And that's what it means by liberating the mind from that body. And also liberating it from what we call the five hindrances. Liberating it from wanting anything. You don't want anything anymore because oh, this is it's like winning the jackpot. And no ill will can come from a state like that. No restlessness, no so oh, no tiredness. Oh, way too much energy for that, but poised energy. And no doubt anymore because you have, you know, for this time anyway, you have a very clear mind, very powerful mindfulness. So what you see, you know is real. So experience this beautiful release of the mind called the jhanas. There's much more to say about those and much more to do afterwards after emerging from the jhanas. But this just becomes that uh, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth stage of Anapanasati. And what the Buddha says, uh, on those occasions you are mindful of the jitta, which is the third Satipatthana. Having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose, and mindful. I do not say there is development of mindfulness of breathing for one who is dull, who is not fully aware. And fully aware means the reaching the jhanas. This is where the highest mindfulness, the highest awareness, the purity of mindfulness, and that's fourth jhana, you can read that yourself later. Reading a jhana with the hindrance is gone. That is why on that occasion a meditator abides, mindful of the mind, having restrained the five hindrances, energized, fully aware of the purpose and mindful. And this happens. And what is important is to know that this happens sometimes automatically. In my life teaching this, I've met, I've met a couple of people who I don't even know if they've been Buddhists. They've had these experiences and they didn't know what the heck they were. For some reason or another, they really let go. And they experience all these states, just the body just being tracked and just going inside and going inside the mind and getting these wonderful nimittas. 
and going into these jhanas. It happens when they just let it happen. Sometimes I call it letting, pressing the letting go button. I remember this one lady, she, I was in teaching in Penang and my disciples in Penang said, can you please talk to this lady because uh, she wasn't a meditator, but she had some sort of experience and no one could explain what it was. And so she thought she had a psychosis, but she didn't have the symptoms, the after symptoms of a psychosis, but no one could understand what had happened to her. So I just talked to her in this library in the temple of, uh, in Aitam, as a suburb of Penang. And she started describing what she'd experienced. And I must have been smiling, because I said, you know, madam, that was, that was a jhana. And I added a few more details about what she experienced, which she had not told me. And her face lit up. At last, someone understood what she'd experienced. And I said, you know, it's just so lucky to get that experience, that jhana. You probably won't get it again for a long time. But she wasn't actually really wanting to, to actually reproduce it yet. She just wanted to understand it. She realized she hadn't gone mad. She hadn't gone crazy. She experienced this beautiful state. So these sometimes happen to people. And they'll hopefully happen to you one day. So you can experience what it's like to experience this jitter, this mind. Experience this incredible power, beautiful. And also you get huge amounts of insights into what's in the center of you. Center metaphorically. And they understand just how your body and mind works. So there we go. Um, I'm supposed to be doing a 10 minute little a five minute break, followed by a 10 minute meditation, and then quick questions and answers. Um, I, can... I think we might not have that much time for the questions if we do the meditation. Okay. So I guess it depends on the group. I mean, right now we only have about half an hour. Okay, so what we'll do then, we'll do a five minute little break or two minute break. Yeah. So if you need to go to the toilet or just rest something. And then afterwards, we do the Q&A. And if we run out of questions, then we can do the meditation at the end. That's fine by me. Excellent. And please excuse me for just getting into this stuff because it's causing me so much joy to talk about these things and reflect upon them. It's basically why I teach meditation. Because a few people get it and, oh, it brings me so much joy when other people get these wonderful deep meditations. It's actually understanding about what Buddhism is, the deep Buddhism. Why not? Okay, I'm going to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> So yeah, please take a break, anyone who needs one for a couple of minutes. And uh, if you do have a question that's, uh, that you'd like to put to Anne-Marie, she'll pass that on and I'll lead that out to Ajahn Brown. Excellent. We already have one. Very good. Okay, is it a good time to continue or? Check how many people uh, seem to be in their seat. Probably more than 50%. Okay. 
Okay. So the first question is, oh, now the first question we can the second question. Okay, how do you translate virya, one of the seven factors of enlightenment? I think uh, they probably mean Dhamma Vichaya, but I'm not sure. Oh, no, no, either, um, no. Some translate it as willpower, and this always appeared as very tense and not relaxing to me. So I guess they mean yeah. virya as one of the balas. Yes, indeed. But it's also you have like samoyama as one of the parts of the Eightfold Path. And you know, what actually, virya, what does that mean? And again, looking at some of the um, other ways those group of words are used, we have the word vira, from which vira mean, vira comes from. Vira is an adjective which is related to the noun vira. And they have like Mahavira was supposed to be the leader of the Jains. Vira was a hero. So in that concept of like uh, of agriculture and soldiers, a soldier who would give up their life for the cause would not hold anything back and sacrifice everything, was supposed to be the hero, the vira. So the idea of virya is not just willpower, because willpower is just getting something for yourself. Virya is more that energy to renounce to the max, to do the service for, you know, the the king or the, whoever was, you know, the citizens of the a republic in which you were living in. That was the idea of a virya. It's a, a, almost like a, not a sacrificial, but a letting go, a renouncing, a selfless effort. You may know that willpower, coming from the, what I want to achieve, or what I want to get, what I want to get rid of, there's always a self behind that. And me wanting to get rid of stuff which is I don't like, or which is causing me problems. But the energy which is selfless, the energy which is like serving, like you know, all those incredible people just looking after this event, this bliss upon bliss event. There's an incredible amount of service and letting go. So you know, you are practicing virya. You're sacrificing what you could be doing and you know, just enjoying the meditation like everybody else on this bliss upon bliss upon bliss retreat so you can serve others. That's Viria. You're not getting anything out of this. You're not getting paid. You're not going to get special privileges afterwards. It's a sacrificial effort, not a willpower effort. Okay. Hopefully that gives an understanding. Yeah. yeah. So someone's asking, Medini's asking, that if after a long intensive days of meditation towards the end of a 10 day retreat, for instance, sometimes mm. I start to hallucinate. Why does uh, this happen? Has it perhaps got to do with wrong concentration and how do I prevent this? It could be wrong concentration. I'm not quite sure you'd have to investigate more deeply, but if you get even hallucinations, if you get like images appear in the mind, if it's accompanied with joy and peace, it's a totally different ball game. There's our nimitas. Even like, you know, coarse nimitas, but the nimitas should always come from a place of peace where the body vanishes and you can start to see things. But these are seeing things which don't cause any problems at all to you. You know, you know exactly what they are, the nimitas, and just whatever you're seeing there is a creation of the mind. And here's a nice little story. It's amusing. And uh, for some people, I say this because some people get scared of those, some hallucinations which might come up. And this is a personal story, just after getting into a nice, reasonably deep meditation, that the nimitta which came up in my mind was of a monster. Now this monster, I still can recall it because these experiences, your mindfulness is quite clear. So you can remember very easily. This monster had its big bulging eyeballs, red, and it had its eyebrows were just going inwards, like it was angry, and its its hair was spiky. I mean, really sort of dangerously spiky, and around its neck, it had uh, some skulls in there, and it looked ah oh it's, that's right its its mouth was open with with 
uh, vampire-like teeth all over and with a big red tongue. And like I remembered where I'd seen that because I've been to a, a Tibetan temple and they have these pictures of monsters on the walls there. But there it was right in my mind when I was meditating. Ugh. And so I had enough understanding what was going on. It's a mind creation. I'd created it so I could mess around with it. And so first of all, in these big eyeballs, you know, just po almost poking out from its, the eye sockets, which is quite scary. So I put a pair of sunglasses on it. I think he used to call them Ray-Bans all over his eyes. And because he had really spiky hair, I put a, a straw hat on it with a little flower coming out. Really cute. And I blacked out a few of its teeth. All you need to do is to think that and the, the teeth sort of disappeared. Like it really needed to go and see a monster dentist pretty quickly. And also I put a cigarette in its mouth, doodled on it. And soon that monster, who was quite scary at first, became just so ridiculous, I laughed. And that was the end of that limiter. These are mind creations, so you can mess around with them if you wish and have some fun. Maybe it's because I've got a playful mind, I don't know. But it's certainly, I told that to other people, and they've done that, and they've had a wonderful time. It was like <laughs> drawing funny, <laughs> funny things on monsters' heads if they come up during the meditation. So I don't know what your hallucination is. But if you have a joyful mind, which is supposed to happen if it's limiters, then it's not a problem at all. Of course, you need, do, would need to have much more information to find out exactly what's going on. Okay, we have a question from Fabrizio. I'll condense it a little oh. bit. Yeah, so you know Fabrizio. him from Jana Grove, yeah. Yeah. So he said that this morning in the meditation, he got very calm and peaceful and felt as if the sense of self started to fade away, similar to what happened when he came to Perth. But yeah. since then, he's been um, overwhelmed by emotions and has been crying because he feels that he lacks the trust to completely let go. So it's as though um, his self is scared to find out that it's actually a fabrication. Yeah. But... The, you don't worry about those things because you can't do it. Fabrizio, you cannot get into those deep meditations. It's impossible for you. <laughs> in other words, you just vanish one day and it just happens and think, wow, how did that happen? You just don't get in its way. So things start to happen. And yeah, you didn't get into it this time, but don't be so sad because sometimes that just the energy just builds and builds and builds and builds and you can't resist it. I just remember the time, just, oh, it's almost like you have a choice. He's, you're on a, a ledge. Should I let go? He said, no, it's too scary to let go. But then you can just see where you're going to end up in this beautiful bliss state. But I'll oh, just, oh, I don't want to do it. It's too scary. But oh, it's just so wonderful. It's just too scary. It's just so wonderful. And after all, the pleasure will bring you in. It's just too nice to let go. And after a while, you find. Fabrizio will start to defabricate, defabrizio Kate, mm -hmm. and then just to disappear. And sometimes it happens and you just, the meditation is just too powerful, you can't resist it. So, because you didn't do it this morning, don't worry, Fabrizio, I think you're on the list for next year's range retreat. And if it happens, then we can all travel again, which would be wonderful. So it just, it will happen. Maybe it didn't happen this morning, but don't worry. You're getting closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. And the time will come. It has to come. As I mentioned to many people, I've mentioned to, uh, to a lot of people a long time ago, I'm sorry for busy. For people like you, it's far too late. You've already been brainwashed so much by me. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> so just, just wait. No need to, to worry. Um, Ajahn, I think he's actually, um, the fear is the obstacle there. That's what I understood. Like, have yeah. you any tips to, for him to work with the fear of letting go? The fear, sometimes it just seems seem, these things happen. And, you know, the fear, well, what's a fear? And it just happens before you realise what you've been doing. So the fear comes obviously from the sense of self. All fear is losing something which you think you own. You don't own it anyway. So after a while, 
after a while, when things start to disappear, you realize, oh, I didn't really own that. And that's it's nicer when it's gone. And then you say, wow, what was I afraid of that for? So all the fear is when you feel your something is disappearing from you and you, you project into the future. What, I don't know what it's like when I don't have that. It's going to be really painful or really suffering. But, you know, Fabrizio knows me that, you know, when these things start to disappear, it's wonderful. It's amazing. So have some little trust and confidence. I know what I was talking about. And give it a try. Say, so, well, you know, and it's not forever. So once you let go of these things, you come back again. And it's a bit of a, oh, a drag, a bug. Oh, I've gone back again. I've got to hold on to this thing again for a while. But actually to have those moments when you're free, you're free from all these things which they really tire you and they weigh you down little by little. Those things which you're attached to get less and less important and the fear gets less and less powerful. And don't worry so much because even the Buddha was afraid when he had these states. And he mentions that if you really teach the Dharma really properly, then you do make people a little bit afraid. So it's afraid because you know what's going on. And after a while, you won't be able to resist it. In the deep meditations, you get so peaceful, so calm. The calmness there means the fear just can't really establish itself. The calm gets so strong, it just draws you in deeper and deeper into it. So peaceful. And after a while, you just finally go into those states when you come out afterwards, you think, what on earth was I afraid of? Thank you, Ajahn. Um, so Santu has a question about the connection or the difference between the brain and the mind. Is the mind also impermanent? Yes, the mind is impermanent, but it is, it is, the stream of consciousness, which is like the stream of many mind states, is just it's like a river. So if you look at your mind, this thing which you call the mind, you do actually find that it's like standing on a bridge looking down and seeing all the water going past. And if you look on the River Thames, you know, when you go on a walk from the Oxford Wehara, there, you see, it looks the same today as it looked last week. You know, it's totally different water. And that's the nature of the mind. It's always changing. That's why the Buddha said it changes from moment to moment. And that's the, the brain. The brain is part of your body. You know, that lasts a lifetime. But then after a while, that, that too will stop. So this stream of consciousness, it may look like it's more long lasting than the brain, because it can go from this life to the next life and to the next life, but always changing as it goes. That's why the Buddha said that it's better, it's better for you to take this body as a self, because at least it lasts for 50, 60, 70, 80 years. This mind is changing every day so much. And it's really, you don't understand the mind if you think this mind is permanent or you think there's some type of consciousness which is permanent, like an original mind or an amateur jitter. Anyone who really knows their jhanas can come out afterwards and can understand what it feels like. Well, they always know that this mind is not permanent. There is no consciousness which can last forever. If you doubt me on that, just go to the very first teaching of the Buddha in the Brahma Jhana Sutta. The first sutta of the Deacon Nikaya, and it's wrong view number eight. The Brahmacharya Sutta, Deacon Nikaya. Wrong view number eight. It gives 62 wrong views. And number eight of that is uh, people who have the view that the jitter or the mind or consciousness is permanent and everlasting. And that's, you know, the Buddha mentioned that so clearly, so obviously. That's also reflected in so many other teachings in the taught by the Buddha. Okay. Thank you, Ajahn. So for Matt, he says that sometimes lights come up, but his eyes want to focus on them and that causes his eyes to roll up. 
Oh, is yeah. there a way to help relax the eyes so that they stay calm? Yeah, but that's a common experience. And you may think this is a simple solution, but it actually works. Get some eye shades. And uh, in those days when I went on aircraft, you know, for long distances, like to England, you know, they give you some eye shades you could actually wear. And I'd collect a lot of them and then actually give them out to people who had that problem. You know, the eye shades, you put them over your eyes. And that will tell your eyes, you cannot be seeing a light. And this is an, an inner experience, not a visual experience. And that would actually stop the eyes from actually moving. After a while, the eyes will know because they know there's a, an eye shade on you. And that means that it can't be a physical light. So the, the eyes will stop moving. And you realize that this is a visual light inside the mind. So it's not visual light, it's a, a limited light in the mind and you can just enjoy it without being disturbed. Great. Shirley has a question. She says that um, when her mind gets peaceful and settles on the breath, she still experiences, she experiences pleasant feelings, but the experience of the body is still there in the background. Should she let I, the breath fade more into the background too and bring the pleasant feeling into the foreground or vice versa? She should do nothing. <laughs> it's working, you're doing the right thing. But it's just the way that, um, that the mind works. Uh, for those of you who can see me, you can actually focus on the tip of my nose. You can zoom in on it. And as you zoom in on it, what's on the edges starts to disappear. So this is just the way the mind works. It goes into the center of things and what's on the edge disappears. If you ever gone on to like Google Maps and you're looking at sort of June Street in Oxford and when you first go into to Google Maps, you know, you can see the whole of Britain and you sort of focus in, zoom in and parts of it start to disappear and just the, you know, the outline Cornwall and Scotland disappears and you go deeper in and further in and what's on the edges vanishes and what's in the middle stays. In other words, you go deeper and deeper in. And it was on the edge of the radar, falls off the radar, so you can't see it anymore. And that's what happens with the meditation. Yeah, the body is there, but it's on the edge. It's about to fall off. Or like sometimes people say that it's like 100 miles away. They can know it's there, but it's going further away and you can hardly feel it anymore. And then you've got the sort of the breath and you've got the delight in the middle of the breath. And after a while, the breath just vanishes. It vanishes by itself and you've just got the delight left. So don't try and focus on anything because that will disturb the whole process. Just whatever you're experiencing is the most important thing in the whole world. Okay. In the present moment and just care for it. And you find it happens all by itself. The only thing you can do is to disturb it. The simile, which again, I read in an Air Asia magazine when I was flying somewhere to somewhere, the flights of the future will only have a captain and a dog in the cockpit. No other flight staff in the front of the aircraft, just the captain and the dog. And the job of the captain, the only job the captain has in the aircraft is to feed the dog. And the only job of the dog is to bite the captain if he touches anything. It's totally an automatic process, future aircraft, automatic. And it's the same with the mind. To get into deep meditations, I often say to people, if there's a possibility I could get a dog and put it in your, your mind, so you'd leave the, the practice of meditation alone and just let it happen naturally. And every time you try to do anything, oh, the dog will bite you. <laughs> then you get into jhana so quickly. <laughs> so don't do anything. This moment is all the only time you have. Don't think of the future as where you want to do something to get somewhere. No, be in this moment. And just, um, this is important. And care for it. Okay, someone's asking about uh, the wandering mind. So she's asking, were the five years of bringing the mind back from wandering necessary to build up the strength of mindfulness? 
or is consistently being kind with with what is building the strength and then the breath naturally comes to attention <laughs> the second one consistently being kind that's what builds up the mindfulness i didn't know what i was doing and like many people who teach you know we teach and hopefully that people won't make the same mistakes which i made and of course they always do <laughs> make the same mistakes again but hopefully you make the same mistakes less so being kind to the breath or being so kind to this moment. Sorry, I've made that mess of that. Whatever's happening right now is really important. Just be kind to this. If your mind is wandering off, let it wander off. There's beautiful little anecdotes. Again, many of you have heard this of the, uh, oh, this is a Singaporean version where this lady, he was staying over in Bodhinyana Monastery and she was a psychologist. She just finished in, finished training in UK for a psychology degree and was visiting us. When I told her the story that she had a wandering mind, and I told her about you know, how to stop it, and she was laughing her head off. I said, why? And rolling on the floor in front of me. Singaporean young women don't usually do that. <laughs> Literally rolling. And then I said, what's going on? She said, look, when I was young, I had an argument with my mum. And I told my mum, I don't love you anymore. She's about six or seven years of age. I don't love you anymore. I'm leaving home. So the Singapore girl left home for the first time in her life at six or seven years of age. Mum, I want to leave home. And mum said, okay. And I'll help you pack. And there are many mothers or fathers when their kids is causing them problems and they say they want to leave home. Would, would love to do that, but the world is dangerous. So they won't let their kid leave home especially with only six or seven years of age. So the mum helped her pack and gave her $20 to start her life alone. And they went to the elevator, the lift. The kid went in the lift, closed the door, waved goodbye to his mum, to, to the, uh, her mum. Bye-bye, darling, have a nice life. And the elevator, the lift went down to the ground floor. And by, just the kid was alone, left home for the first time with a little suitcase and $20. And then as soon as it got to the ground floor, by that time, the six-year-old was so homesick. <laughs> she managed to reach up to the, the button of the floor in which she lived, and went straight back up. Her mother was waiting. Welcome home, darling. The mother let the child go. No, you won't go far. With so much love and kindness, the child can't go far. We always return back. If you're keeping a bird in a cage, one day you'll let that cage door open by accident and the bird will fly away and never come back again. But if that bird is in a beautiful cage and it's a nice food, safe, warm, that bird might fly away, but always come back again, simply because it's a wonderful cage. So if you have kindness to your mind, your mind might want to go away it always come back by itself and stay with you because you are kind. Okay, we've still got a few questions, so uh, right. try and get through the, as many as we can. Um, Samila is saying that sometimes her body is extremely heavy during the initial part of meditation. And also, how can she be peaceful with sleepiness? Should she allow herself to sleep? So how to oh, work with both yeah. of these? Well, if it's heaviness, there's a type of heaviness in meditation which comes about just before the body vanishes. The body is actually not, I'm not quite sure which heaviness she feels. If it's heaviness, tiredness, weariness, that's one thing. But if it's sometimes the body, you're just watching the body, relaxing it, and it feels heavy, but it's not the heaviness of weight, it's the heaviness of an intense feeling. It's like your mindfulness is becoming strong and the feeling which is always there in the body is being amplified. Sometimes people experience that stage as heaviness. Sometimes they experience it as like ants crawling all over you. Pleasant, not unpleasant. Just everything becomes so sensitive. All the experiences in your body, which you always have, amplified, you can feel them all. You don't worry about that because I know that so well. And then a short, short while later, maybe seconds or minutes at most, then the body vanishes. It's, it's a wonderful ex experience. This is heaviness of the 
tiredness or weariness or sleepiness, you will find that if you fight that sleepiness, you're wasting the little energy you have. It's best just to allow yourself to have some sleep. If you're meditating, just even just lean back on a nice comfortable chair or something and just have a, a little nap. Don't fight, but learn. And if you are really sleepy, you know they have these wonderful inventions, which we call, I don't know if you've got one or if you've tried it before, wonderful inventions called beds. <laughs> so get in your bed and take a nap. And I mention that not as an indulgence, but as a wonderful meditation technique. Because so often on these long retreats, people come up and they told me their meditation is hopeless, they're not getting anywhere, they can't be still. And I look at them and it's obvious what the cause is. And I said, just go to bed. I can't go to bed, it's the middle of the day. I said, look, I'm the teacher, go to bed. No, I won't. I order you, go to bed. And don't put the alarm clock on. Just go to bed, tuck yourself in, and whenever you wake up, you wake up. And when you wake up, just have a cup of tea or a shower or just you know, put some water on your face and then come and meditate. And they'd always, so many times I've done this for people, and they've always come up afterwards, Ajahn Plum, thank you, that was the best meditation after I rested. Because what's happening is your body, your mind is asking you, please, 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 I'm tired. I really need that rest. And if you're kind to your body, your body becomes kind to you. It's like your body says, oh, thank you, thank you. I really needed that. Now, what do you want? So I want to meditate. Said, yes, we'll meditate together. Your body is not your slave. It's a friend. Your mind, your brain is not your slave. Treat it with kindness, with respect. We work together. And sometimes your body or your brain says, look, I really am tired. I really need to rest. You know, I, I was mentioning the other day just I'm in very good health and one of the reasons why is there are times if I have the opportunity and I'm just meditating, I feel just really tired or really just you know, not balanced. And if I have the opportunity, I go in my cave, lock the door and lay down. And if I do, just only for half an hour or something, and if it's the right thing, you just fall asleep straight away. And you wake up and you feel so bright and so wonderful afterwards. And my theory is that it may be a cold or a flu or something. And then my body is saying, look, give me half an hour and I'll sort it out for you, Rajan Brahm. And I trust my body and I just rest it. And it's not that long. And when I come out afterwards, oh, full of energy. So be sensitive to your own body. And if you are, then you're giving the body a chance to heal itself, and it works. So don't fight sloth and torpor, please. Just get to know it as a friend. Okay. So I've got two questions along a similar line about right effort. So one is about um, replacing unwholesome thoughts with wholesome thoughts. Yeah. And um, they're saying that sometimes it feels like uh, fighting the mind. And the other person is asking about how to strike a balance between developing wholesome emotions like the Brahma Viharas and not doing. So it's a general question uh, about that balance. Yeah, it's, you know, sometimes it's not even a balance. It's a right effort. I don't call it right effort in my translation of that part of the Eightfold Path. I, I, what was it, right endeavor? endeavor. Was, yeah, or whatever, but not the effort. The idea of Samawayama being effort. Effort is coming from a self. It's learning how to, the other thing which I, I think actually I'm aiming towards, or leaning more towards right restraint. Because that's the first part of the four right efforts. Just restraining unwholesome qualities. Saying no to them. It's not doing things, it's just letting go of things. It's a non-doing, not a doing. Letting go of unwholesome qualities. If unwholesome qualities are in the mind, you know how you can abandon them. How do you abandon unwholesome qualities in the mind? They're monsters in the Empress Palace. You're kind to them. That's how they disappear. 
developing wholesome qualities in the mind. How do you develop wholesome qualities in the mind? Coming on meditation retreats, keeping precepts. These are not doing of bad things and having things motivated by joy and happiness and selflessness. Because why effort? To me, it sort of all comes from the sense of a self wanting to do something and gain something and get somewhere. In the world, maybe you can do that, but if you want in meditation, if it's effort, you're making too strong a sense of me and mine, the self, and ego. And I've seen that even some of the monks which I've known have got huge amounts of effort and huge egos to match. And they're really a pain in the butt to live with. But the kind monks, they're just so nice to live with. And they don't criticize you. You feel so much kindness and support from them. And they're just, uh, you can see their own meditation. They don't have effort. It becomes this natural process. They just let go of themselves. Everything becomes so peaceful all by itself. The old, <laughs> I can't really do this, but you know, I, I've done it in front of you before. I chanda, you know, just I've got water in my cup, a little bit in the bottom here. How do I keep the water perfectly still? So how do I keep my water perfectly still in the cup? First of all, it's not still. Why? Because I'm not being mindful. I'm now being mindful. The water in my cup is moving. because I'm not concentrating. Now I'll be mindful and concentrating. I'm going to put some effort into this. Now, now honestly, I'm trying to hold this water perfectly still. I can't do it. No matter how much effort you put in, you will never be able to hold water in a cup perfectly still. But how do you get the water to be still? Water is a, a classical simile for the mind. Stillness is samadhi, meditation. How do I get this water to be perfectly still? You put it down. Or maybe you can't see that. Oh, yeah, you can see I'll put it down. <laughs> <laughs> When you put it down, it becomes still all by itself. Now that is like the, the answer to, you know, the right effort doesn't work. Effort, you never get stillness through effort. Where you get stillness from is letting go, renunciation. So I don't know, maybe you can call Samawayama right letting go. I don't know, the renunciation works. So not effort. All right. We've got three minutes left and there's a couple of questions about experiences that people aren't sure what to, uh, what they are. So okay, I'll try it. and put them together. And, um, yeah. and then there's one more about a nimitta. So one person saying they have an experience like something's popping in the, in the head and they've had this twice and then they see like a skeleton or a skull and they're yeah. wondering if this is a jhana. And the other person is saying that they're experiencing a lot of peace and love, but a complicated um, visions and vibrations, um, okay. like a morphing field of energy. And they want to know if that is a jhana. So could you please explain? Those? No, jhanas <laughs> are when the body is totally gone and no perception of the body. Very fine, very peaceful, very simple. If you still have the experience of something popping in your head, you haven't let the body go yet. You've got to go much deeper than that. So that is not a jhana. The jhana comes with incredible bliss. And the second question, you feel very blessed, but things are moving too much. This field is morphing into that or whatever. You find the even the first jhana, it's incredibly still. It's not perfectly still. Is what I call the wobble. It's the Vitaka Vichara. There's no thinking either. There's no ability to take notes. What happens is after you emerge from those deep states, that you can remember them so clearly. In those states, you haven't got a clue where you are, and it's incredibly blissful. Afterwards, you use what's called Pachawakanayana, the wisdom of just remembering these are these are like traumatic but in a positive sense like if you have a trauma in a car or something you can't get it out of your mind just like these beautiful beautiful states of meditation it's so easy to recall 
And that's where you can analyze them if you want to. Oh, why are you in there? One of the things is no thinking, no perception of the body. If someone touched you, you would never know. They shouted at you, you'd never hear it. You're deep inside. Five senses stop for a while. And afterwards, so five senses stopped, no thinking, blissed out of your skull. And I'm only saying that just as a metaphor, but really, really strong bliss. When you come out afterwards, oh, you just, the only simile which I know of, which sort of works, but not really well, which is like, a, like maybe a friend of yours, a daughter or a son who's just fallen in love. Oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, <laughs> that's how one feels after those jhanas, emotionally just walking on air and no hindrances at all. So sometimes, you know, if somebody gets into what they think is a jhana, I'm, I shouldn't really tell you all these tricks, but here we go. Sometimes I, I tell them, I said, you, you're a girl. Girls can't get jhanas. And I just wait to see the expression on their face. And if they're still very peaceful, oh, yes, no, then it doesn't matter. And I say, oh, maybe that was a jhana. But if they get really upset and angry, oh, what are you saying, Ajahn Brahm? You can't say that. And I say, well, obviously it wasn't a jhana. But by the way, girls can get into jhanas. And actually, my experience of you no know, teaching that women have, more women get into jhanas than men do. That's just anecdotal. The ones I've taught anyway. Lots of men have gone into jhanas, but the women seem to have an easier time of it. I won't sort of go further into that, but anyway, so that's actually the real jhanas, just afterwards, just so peaceful, so blissed out. Nothing can upset you. You're like that for sometimes days. And also that so while you're in there, you can't think, you can't feel. Can't feel anybody up. Okay. Can we do one more because it's about working yeah. with no meters? Just last one. So, Certainly. firstly, there was the one we just answered, but this person saw this skull and then they felt like they wanted to stop the meditation. So, I think this skull was a kind of nimitter. And then another yeah. person saying that they get a kind of firework nimitter. So, it's not stable, oh, but it yeah. still has some joy with it. And do you have yeah. any suggestions how to work with those kind of nimitters? Oh, yeah. It's, the firework nimitters are very. Uh, they're great. And you just you just watch them. Have a nice firework display in your mind. Have some fun. Enjoy it. Because sometimes meditation can be just quite long. When you get these things happening, just get into it. I say that, but you know, some meditation teachers complain to me, say, no, 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 you should do something more profound than that. No, I think people need some fun and some almost... Um, entertainment if you like during the retreat so if you see the fire firework limiters enjoy them and then and then see if there's one of them which is more slow than the others more beautiful than the others look for stability and intensity and who knows that one of those firework limiters the mind could just get into it and that light just stays a bit longer and then the next one stays longer still. And the longer it stays, the more brilliant and beautiful it will be. And just the fiber nimitta will just morph into a beautiful nimitta and then just take you into the deep meditations. But there, great, fiber nimitta is a brilliant. Enjoy it and see what happens next. But the skull nimitta, well, the skull is many monks, these super monks, we practice just looking at skulls. And what happens if you really do that, if you get a skull limiter, just keep focusing on just the skull, nothing else. And after a while, the skull starts to look beautiful. It's like the clump of bamboo looked beautiful to me. When it starts to look beautiful, it's like white, it starts to glow. It starts almost like be fluorescent white. Just let it happen, just be there. Don't make it happen, just let it happen. And that bit turns into a beautiful limiter which leads very easily into the deep meditations. So it starts off with like a skull, but then it becomes, turns into a nimitta. And that's really quite common with meditators who get like visions of skulls. 
Just leave it alone, be with it, don't be afraid of it. And just let it develop into this most beautiful scarf you've ever seen in the whole world. <laughs> okay. There's an, one more question <laughs> and then we've almost okay. finished it. Can we do yeah, one more? Yes, certainly, yeah. Okay, it's very quick, I think. They're just asking if a person experiences a jhana only once in their lifetime, can that experience help one on the path? Enormously, yes. Because if it is a real jhana, a real, real one, not one of these uh, fake ones, of course, you can always remember it. It's brilliant, it's beautiful. You can always understand how that relates to your own experience. Later on in this little retreat, you have to get into the next part of Anapanasati is using these experiences to develop insight. And uh, this, even just the one jhana you've had, uh, how can you understand what that means? It's the nature of your mind, the nature of reality, and just uh, what happens when you die. There's so much juicy insight to get from these jhanas. It's like you've, you've been a miner and you struck a, a huge seam of gold and you can just mine that gold for a lifetime. It's always there for you to remember, to understand and use as your insight. Okay. Okie okay, dokie. Okay. So there we are. And I must admit that I don't mind the extra time when it's talking about things like nimittas and, and stuff like that, because you know there's not many people who can explain those nimittas. That's one of my strengths. And so when people have those experiences, I don't mind spending extra time helping them. So anyway, I wish you all a happy evening. May you all have a, oh, for me's evening, a happy afternoon, with lots of good meditation, and may you all get some beautiful, beautiful nimittas. <laughs> and even jhanas. Who knows? Okay, good night, everyone. Thank you, Ajahn. Good night. Good night.